Yeah, I'm just going to walk around with it. All right. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Today is the keynote lecture of landscape urbanism, uh, with which we finalize the year, well, actually, 16 month uh, program of landscape urbanism and market students. And uh, what a best way to do that with Tim uh, Waterman, who is a colleague and a friend of the program, a landscape architect that has been with us in several juries, no? and we have discussions about uh, where the program is heading, what kind of projects we do, and obviously we enjoyed a lot his feedback. And we are more than happy to have him here today to lecture on uh, uh, the tasty city, democratic life, and the education of desire. Tim Waterman, uh, for those who uh, don't know him, is a professor of landscape theory at the Bartlett School of Architecture and UCL. He is the author of The Landscape of Utopia, Writing Some Everyday Life, uh, Taste, Democracy, and Design, and the editor of Landscape Citizenship with Ed Wall and Jane Wolf. Landscape Agency Critical Essays with Ed Wall and the Rowledge Handbook of Landscape and Food with Joshua Seina. We have the bookshop around the corner for those who are here and want to get a copy of any of those books. So uh, without more delay, I hand it over to Tim. Thank you very much, Tim, and we look forward to the lecture. Thank you so much, Alfredo, and thank you to um, everyone here at the AA. Um, I've got, what, an hour max? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll watch, my, watch my time then. Um, right, so the Tasty City. This, this is actually the, the last chapter in my newest book, The Landscape of Utopia. So if you're curious to explore some of these ideas in more depth, uh, that, that, that's where you'll find them. Although, typically with my work, I tend to wander all over the place with, with, with my ideas. Um, and that's kind of precisely what happens uh, in this lecture. So uh, I began that, uh, that image you've been looking at was the, um, was the Luna Park in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and I, I think the sort of wonderful sort of olfactory associations of entering uh, through the mouth uh, is a kind of nice way to start thinking about tasting the city. But I'm going to talk about taste in much larger uh, terms. And I'm also going to talk about tastes and dreams um, and how those come together. So I love this quote uh, from uh, Joseph Rickwert, and this image that you're looking at now is, uh, is two cabarets that were side by side uh, in Paris up until 1950, if you can believe it. They were built in the 1890s and demolished in, in 1950s to, to make way for the new entrance to a monoprix, uh, if you can imagine. Um, but the one on the uh, on this side is Le Ciel Heaven, and the other is L'Enfer. So you enter through the mouth of Leviathan to go into the, the hell-themed cabaret. Um, what fun. I want to give you a little background, too, about me. Um, I didn't start in landscape architecture. In fact, I started in the restaurant business, and I worked in the book business. Um, I, and I, I've kind of been all over. So my work is informed not just by architectural and landscape architectural theory, but by real experience in the world. Um, and this was my restaurant in Moscow, Idaho, uh, which was open in 1997 and 98. Uh, it was very successful in every regard except for financially. <laughs> um, this was it dressed for, uh, for, for Valentine's Day in, in 1998, uh, about six months before I locked the doors permanently. Um, and here's my younger self before I learned how to do architectural lettering. Um, and and that's, that's, that's me uh, theatrically pouring espresso. Um, but uh, let's not dwell on that because you're gonna be critiquing my menu. Um, these are um, my two most recent books. Uh, the, the, the first one, Landscape Citizenships, which is with uh, Ed Wall and Jane Wolfe, as mentioned, really thinking about how landscapes form a, a frame for thinking about our relationships. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. And then secondly, 
The Landscape of Utopia, which is a collection not just of my academic writing, but of my journalistic writing. So it's, I've tried to make the book a little bit more accessible. There's, there's light pieces interspersed with heavier pieces. So I, I feel like it's a book you can either snack on or feast on uh, as you wish, which is keeping with my gustatory theme. So let me talk about landscape citizenship uh, briefly. So this, um, this is uh, an idea that really developed from discussions that I've had in particular with the Center for Landscape Democracy uh, in Norway. Uh, and there are developing discourses, I think, that are incredibly valuable that use landscape as a frame for thinking through justice, democracy, um, and spatial justice, where landscape forms the platform for, for, for thinking about that. So it, it's a bit like uh, Edward Soge's discussion of spatial justice, but using the understanding of landscape to build those off of. And we felt like what was missing uh, was a discussion of citizenship in relation to that. So that kind of completed that, that, that triad. And there's also been an enlargement of the idea of the Lefebvrean idea of the right to the city uh, with the right to landscape, which treats uh, uh, the, the built environment as a whole, as a place to which uh, people have that Lefebvrean right. So if you begin to break these words down, um, and uh, I, 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 a lot of this is based in Kenneth Olwig's philological research into landscape studies, um, that the, the, the suffix scape is cognate not just with shape, with form, uh, but also with the suffix ship. So you can think of that suffix ship and the way it functions in terms such as friendship, relationship, comradeship, township, stewardship, right? It's, it's, a, it's a set of relations. So what that allows us to do is pull all this together into a, an idea of landscape as land ship, as a set of relations based in place that are indivisible and interdependent. Um, and the idea that, that people and their environments are mutually constituted is at the core of this. Uh, so landscape makes us, we make it, and in that set of relations uh, is found the idea of landscape. Um, so, so to me, I think that's really vital. And when we speak about working with landscape, we are not talking about objects and forms as much as we're talking about a practice that is fundamentally based in the design of relationships, relations with and in the world and with each other. Uh, and those ideas uh, have come out of regionalism and bioregionalism and environmental writings such as Gary Snyder um, and in Kenneth Olwig's really very important work on conceptions of landscape in the history of the commons and so on and so forth. And the, the presentations we looked at this morning were covering a lot of these kinds of ideas around the commons and, and relationships. So I think very excitingly, the work that's happening here at the Architectural Association and the, our new landscape architecture program as it's developing at the Bartlett is really expanding the sphere of discussion uh, for thinking about the, the built environment. For me, uh, as you may have guessed from my past in the restaurant business and my past as a cook, and I'm still an avid home cook, um, it, it, the idea of taste is really important. Um, and it's one of the most fundamental ways in which we encounter the world. I mean, we actually take particles of the world and ingest them directly into our bodies. It's a frightening relationship, right? Because you could be poisoned or you could, you could get food poisoning or you could, um, uh, but you can also experience uh, delights. Uh, so it's that kind of radical openness to the world, which is a bittersweet relation with the world that that, that, that taste is all about. Um, my work in taste has actually added to the field of the study of taste in general um, in that there's the idea of, of, of discovered taste, which is, um, which is base, your basic tastes, like those things that are automatically delicious. Sweet, salt, fat, uh, you know, like chips, right? Everyone likes chips. So that's, that's a basic taste. You don't have to learn how to like French fries. Um, but then acquired taste is a different realm, and it really uh, colors absolutely every way in which we enter into society. 
and every way in which we prepare ourselves to become part of, the, of, a, of a world of interaction. Uh, so I've separated this out, and this is my contribution here, is that the idea of a crude taste is that there are tastes that you, you come into contact with just because you've been raised there. So a Mediterranean taste for olives, for example, is rooted in, in a particular landscape. And whereas, uh, you know, someone growing up in the north of Germany might find olives repellent because they weren't part of their environment growing up. So those are kind of accrued tastes that you're not working on, on acquiring. But educated acquired taste is a different story. And this is where you're basically working out or reading up, learning up in order to participate in a particular social sphere. So to hang out with academics, you might want to gain a taste for single malt scotch. Um, or to appreciate football, you might want to, uh, uh, to gain a taste for lager. Um, none of those things come naturally, and that metaphor applies largely to almost other, every other realm of interaction. So, the idea of educated taste helps us prepare ourselves for a social sphere um, and, and is part of the making of the, so, of the self. And also what it does is it helps up to us to think about the ways in which gustatory taste, the way that we encounter food in the mouth and through our other senses that are associated with ingesting food, and the larger psychosocial and cultural sense of taste are constructed uh, as well, and they're all interdependent and can't be pulled apart. So, taste with a capital T uh, is an idea that comes from Carolyn Korsmeyer, the philosopher of taste, um, and she separates the two. She writes taste with a capital T to talk about psychosocial cultural taste, um, and taste with a lowercase t to talk about gustatory taste. Um, so, I don't always use that, but I do find her work really very useful in that she does talk about social striving at the same time as she's talking about our encounters with food. Um, and of course, there's a Bourdieuian element to the work where she's talking about distinction and the way that we gain distinction for ourselves and in our environments. And this is a lovely book, by the way, if you really want to encounter the full breadth of the understanding of, of taste from a, from a, a philosophical sense uh, it's a wonderful book. She's also got a new book called Things, uh, which is about our, our, our touch encounter with things in the world. Great stuff, uh, really beautiful work. Um, but also, I think there's this civic realm. If we're speaking about the city, and it's in the title of my lecture to talk about the, the tasty city, um, what Edward Soja does is he helps us understand that the city is not a collection of forms and objects, of buildings and landscapes, but, but it is, in fact, a, a, a construct of mutual regard. The polis involves politeness. It involves inhabiting the world together. So uh, again, I think the, the, the understanding of educated taste um, and our mutual tastes, our mutual regard are really, really fundamental to the way that we build the city. Um, and what else I think is really important here is that Soja f cites democracy and its practices not in parliament or Congress, but in the street. If people are to rule themselves, they must rule themselves in the spaces of everyday life because that's where life happens. It doesn't happen in Parliament. Uh, so to me and to Soja both, I think the citing of democracy in public space and public life, everyday interaction is absolutely key, which is why coming to terms with these woolly, difficult things like taste is so very important to understanding how democracy acts in the world. Oh, it's an even longer quotation. Uh, don't, don't try reading all of this. I would definitely recommend uh, looking at Václav Havel's Summer Meditations. Havel speaks very explicitly throughout this book and about the changes that happened in the Czech Republic post, I don't want to call it post-communist, post-authoritarian state uh, Czech Republic, um, where he really spoke about civic life as being a compact between citizens who had to have good taste 
and mutual regard, and that this was fundamental. Um, I do want it to be clear that I'm not talking about some sort of universal idea of good taste, right? That there's not, um, you, uh, not a shop where you can go and buy it, that there are different realms of good taste. I spoke before about you know, good taste for academics and learning to like single malt scotch, but there's also good taste for people who are down the pub watching the footy. Um, th there are different realms of taste. Uh, there, there is no one sort of chauvinistic idea of taste. So, um, so I think Václav Havel is really important for having uh, defined that for us. Um, one of the gifts of the last few years has been an increasing interest in ideas that have come to us from indigenous peoples around the world. Um, Max Liboiron is one of those, and their book, um, Pollution is Colonialism, I think is of tremendous value. First of all, for the generosity of its scholarship. There is a thank you on every page of the book. Thank you to this person for for, for giving me this. Thank you to this landscape for providing me with these opportunities. Um, it, it really is a way of practicing that is absolutely engaged in the world that I find hugely inspiring. Um, and uh, Liboiron is a fisheries scientist uh, who actually I think has wrote, written one of the most important books about scholarship in general, uh, perhaps in the last decade. It's really electrifying, this, this particular book. Um, and good relations are at the heart of the ideas in Liboiron's book. So it's, it's our relations with other species, it's our relationship with our organic and inorganic environment, it's our relationship with each other. Um, and what qualifies goodness in all of the cases that, that, that they look at is good relations. So it's not a, a, a divide between good and evil. It's, it's a, a thinking through good relations and bad relations. And each one of those, of course, is specifically situated in place and dependent upon its context. And I, I would say dependent upon its landship. So good relations and bad relations are found in landships um, and evaluated through the mutual relations we have uh, through questions of of taste. Um, beige holes. Uh, this is, I, I, I've written about a phenomenon in development um, which is everywhere evident in central London now. Um, and this is a phenomenon that, that works a little bit like a black hole in the way that a black hole sucks in matter and condenses it in space. A beige hole in the city sucks in capital and condenses it in space. And it does this in places that are largely devoid of anything that you might attach taste in any regard to. The, 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 um, the term that the queer theorist uh, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick uses for this is strategic banalization. Right, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strategic leveling of things to a kind of pablum-like nothingness. So just down the road, um, this, is a, this is the beigest picture I could find. <laughs> um, and, and it is a, a kind of estate agent const, a construct. It's very much relation, in relation to the financialization of real estate and the treatment of buildings as financial instruments and of urban space as financial instruments. So this isn't a, this isn't a flat. This is a, this is a blip on a stock market screen that's colored beige. And it is part of a process which um, some have called intensive colonialism, right? So the history of colonialism is that well, what is colonialism? So, so the, the, the hegemon, the, 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 the overpower, goes overseas, knocks somebody over the head, takes their labor, takes their stuff, and brings that stuff back home and builds nice things with it. Um, and, you know, so that's you know, kind of the relationship, but there's, there's a bit more to it. But that extensive colonialism was realized in 
the landscape of the Americas, for example, as this gridded, um, logical, uh, epistemologically rational landscape. Um, and that's come back home to roost. All of the little sort of warped inner areas of the city that allowed for spaces of creativity um, and, uh, and all the delightful kind of illicit things to occur have now been ironed out to the greatest possible floor plates. So the sorts of strategic banalization of the landscape that happened in colonialism and parceling up of the landscape into, um, uh, into consumable lots uh, is now happening with the floor plates of the city in a big way. Um, but, uh, and this is in interesting because we, had, we were having a conversation about this during the, uh, the reviews that we were just in, um, about the fact that the countryside uh, needs to be made a more convivial place, right? It can't be an empty, lifeless place filled with tractors being driven by remote control, that if we want to have uh, good relations in and with landscape, we need stewardship of people on the land. So we need a re-ruralization of, uh, of society and of our practices. So this myth that we're gonna continue urbanizing forever uh, is, well, I think it's actually in the process of ending and will end um, as, because we will need people on the land to, to do things in different ways. Um, but this is an old working class peasant cafe outside of Brussels. Uh, in a town called Eisringen, um, and its name, uh, which, forgive me for any Flemish speakers, uh, it's in the, in the Verzeckering tegen die grote Dorst, uh, Insurance Against the Great Thirst, which I think is the perfect name for, uh, for a pub. Um, but this isn't a peasant cafe. Uh, this is a middle-class bedroom community now. Um, but I think what it proposes is that there are rich, tasty, convivial ways of making space that are pitched towards different classes. We don't have to bring a particular type of expectation of what the peasant class of the future is going to be and what it might develop from and what their tastes might be. So a reimagining of the countryside and a reimagining of the city has to be able to connect with all types of taste and class and not think, and this is important for us as designers, not to think that we're the ones who are educated to the point where we know what's right in every circumstance. Uh, it really is about listening and coming into dialogue with landscapes, land ships, to figure out what the right thing is to do. Um, back to Fitzroy Place, no. At that. Um, this is uh, a, another really interesting site in London. This is one of my favorite gardens in London. The Dals Anyone been to the Dalston Eastern Curve for a glass of Prosecco on a summer's day? Um, it's a really, really beautiful place, and it, it is full of tensions and contradictions because, of course, Dalston has been gentrifying at a breakneck pace, um, and this was a community garden that was built as a meanwhile space when Dalston was incredibly diverse. And if you go to this site now, it is middle-class white people drinking Prosecco. Uh, so it's, it's changed a lot. Um, and I think those are forces that, that, you know, this space can't answer, right? Those are larger forces to do with the movement of capital in the city and it's just ended up falling victim to that. But what I think is really important about the design for the Dalston Eastern Curve Garden is that it was a landscape architect working with a local community that was absolutely in participation every step of the way and had conceived the site themselves in the first place. Um, so it's not designery fancy. It's actually pretty lowbrow, and there's a clay pizza oven, and. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's the kinds of things that you would want in your neighborhood, basically. Um, and uh, so despite its tensions and contradictions, it's, it's a really interesting site. And I think the fact that it still holds 
appeal for those middle class communities also says something about the nature of participatory design. Um, another, uh, I think that would, the example that I'd like to put forward, this is another older example now, um, but this is the, 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 the activist practice Wayward, who did a lot of work with um, uh, Meanwhile Space. And this is the urban physic garden. And one of the criticisms for this, they were growing sort of medicinal plants and having uh, uh, meetups around food. One of the criticisms of this was that which is kind of precisely leveled at, for example, Extinction Rebellion, like, oh, it's middle class, therefore it doesn't. The change that needs to happen in the world has to happen at every class level and has to be pitched at every class level and thought through at every class level and at the way in which class manifests itself in different landships in different places. Uh, so there's a specificity of design and interaction and participation that is really important. So um, th this a bit more of the physic garden, here's people coming together, looking terribly middle class. Um, and actually the drawings too are, you know, these are the kinds of drawings that you might imagine uh, in an advert for Planet Organic or something like that. You know, there's a, there's a kind of aesthetic there. Um, and and, and I, I think what I'm arguing here is that understanding that and going with the aesthetic is really, really important, that we can't think that, that you know, we're gonna do our shiniest real estate development images and it's gonna have the same effect in, in every setting. Um, and here's Marco Frascari's uh, provocation from, from his uh, wonderful essay on taste and architecture. Um, so he says that taste has been ruled out by the moral standards of the modern movement. Um, that, that is definitely a provocation and I don't think that he's uh, saying this across the board. Um, but I think he is starting to talk about those, that process of strategic banalization um, that comes with the beige hole and the sorts of real estate practices that come along with it. Um, so for me, when I look at the shard and its anodyne sleek surfaces, um, I'm reminded of uh, um, the flavorlessness of a, of a triangle sandwich. Um, so I, I, I suppose I should have photoshopped a triangle sandwich onto the skyline of London. Maybe, maybe I'll, if anyone wants to send me a photoshopped uh, uh, triangle sandwich. So, so let me talk about appetite. Now I've spoken about taste. Um, so if, if humans are cars, and I hate these kind of mechanistic uh, uh, um, comparisons, but I'm going to do it anyway, taste is sort of the, uh, the steering. Uh, appetite is, is like the accelerator and the brakes. Um, and appetite is governed by um, a bodily mechanism called the apostat, like a thermostat. It, uh, it, it's a, co a combination of enzymes in the gut and the brain and the nervous system all, all saying, it's time to be hungry. Um, you've had enough. You know, this, is, this, is, this is the apostat at work. Um, and I think that these processes of kind of pseudo-modern, neoliberal, beige hole development are like feeding the city without actually tasting anything. It's answering a basic need. Um, it's purely extractive. There's no joy that goes along with it. So I don't think you can have appetite without taste and you shouldn't uh, in the space of the, of the city at all. Um, because hunger isn't just dearth. To be hungry for something is to have desire, is to be filled with desire for something better. Um, and educating desire and educating taste so that they are four different forms of prosperity that fit within a sustainable world uh, is a way of not encountering a gray, bleak world of austerity, but rather reprioritizing what we love um, and what we get out of life. Um, so this is not to put aside all those forms in the city that are so hugely important. 
the, the, the party zone of the city, right? The superfluous, the things that, that are gratuitous. Um, uh, I, I love both of these arguments because they say that is not just a desirable part of the city, a desirable part of human experience, it's necessary. Um, and, and this is you know, akin to many of the discussions that we have about the art function in life. You know, it's that superfluousness, that extraness, the supererogatory function that is so, that some might even call grace, uh, that is so crucial to the, to the urban experience. Um, let's, let's talk about austerity, though, because austerity is not just a stupid idea the Tories came up with, um, but it's an idea that permeates the way that the left and the environmental left often talks about sustainability, uh, that it's about what you have to give up in order to have a future. So uh, don't bother going and seeing this film. It's dreadful. I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about it in the next slide. Um, so, uh, and in fact, the blurb tells you everything you need to know. Um, and I will, I, 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 I say I shouldn't read slides, but I'm gonna read this one because it's so good. A guilty New York liberal, right? Okay, there's already a value judgment, a guilty New York liberal, because if you're a liberal, you're guilty. Um, decides to practice what he preaches for one year, turns off electricity, stops making garbage, and in, this is in the blurb, it's in big letters, gives up TV, you know, oh my God. Uh, amazing that he could do that. What a monster this guy is. Um, taxis and takes out become walking, bicycling, tree hugging, of course, gets, gets um, uh, presumably this is leftists who are writing this stuff, right? Um, polar bear saving, local food eating citizen, all the while taking his baby daughter and caffeine loving, retail obsessed, television addicted wife along with him. He's even more of a monster because he's subjecting his family to sustainability. How dare he? Um, and, uh, okay, so at any rate, that, that completely ignores the fact that there are other elements of prosperity and human flourishing and human goodness and togetherness that aren't, you know, uh, actually maybe sustainability doesn't involve having to give up TV. Um, so that's in contrast to the capitalist, now neoliberal uh, sense uh, uh, that he, it's usually a him, right? He who dies with the most toys wins. When you have acquired everything you need to acquire, you can roll over into your grave because you're done. Um, you've got all the stuff. Um, and this is really, I think, where this is, the, the psychosocial apostat is just simply broken. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing there saying, um, dude, you've had enough. Um, and, and we end up with, with, with excesses uh, like those I've pictured so obviously. Um, these excesses often come to us from the world of advertising, which is recruiting us into realms of uh, overdoing it style capitalism. Um, and my message for all of you as designers is that Advertising does a couple of things very effectively. It combines words and images with a vision of a possible future that has the power to change the future. Um, and that's what you all do. You work on the future and you make words and images of the future. So I would say don't ever forget about the fact that you have a propagandistic function in you to change the world as well. And even if you're working in your day job making sustainable airports, um, you can still be image making on the side and changing the world. Uh, Tom Moylan, um, the, the, the great writer about utopias, um, in his book, Demand the Impossible, uh, writes about what he calls the critical utopia. That first of all, it op operates as critique. And second of all, it has critical mass in the nuclear sense to shift the world. Uh, so do make use of the critical utopia uh, in your work. And here's, here's a kind of history of that advertising, right? This is, this is, um, uh, this is a, a Cadillac uh, Fleetwood from 1958. Um, 
I, I wish it was called a supremacy and not a, a Fleetwood, so I could drive into, into town in my white supremacy. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's only the uh, advertisement. Um, but I, I think what's really curious here is that that advertising of a kind of lifestyle that's associated gets beigeified. Um, and, and I love it too that it, life tastes best when it's well done. Right? Actually, there's no taste happening here at all. It's the tastelessness or the, the, the absence of taste that is so uh, important. Um, well done. This one's overcooked. Um, and, and here is that in relation to the city. So the 1950s U.S. vision of suburbia and the country club is all being reflected in this 1958, whatever else it is, um, Fleetwood. Not, not another Fleetwood. Uh, and this is a contemporary Cadillac in front of the beigeified image of the city. Uh, so the, 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 the image of the city, oh, I was going to talk about James Bond, but I'm not. There's more in the book. Um, the, 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 that sort of beigeified city comes out of a an idea that economic liberalism is the only alternative. And this was something that was, this was actually a campaign slogan for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, there is no alternative. Tina, she was sometimes known as Tina. There's no alternative to economic liberalism. Suck it up. Th th that's what you get. Um, and that ideology is still in operation, um, mixed with a fair amount of neo-fascism and authoritarianism and and Ayn Randian uh, uh, um, selfishness uh, in the current government. Um, so, so the idea that we have to swallow competitive uh, individualism and, and competitive consumption as the bedrock of civilization is something that the establishment has been naturalizing for a very, very long time. Um, but there have been other voices. So I grew up on Sesame Street, right? Which was, which was about a multicultural um, uh, uh, American street, which is really, I mean, I didn't realize I was being spoon-fed Jane Jacobs as, as a child, but that's precisely what was happening with, with Sesame Street. Um, you, I mean, you've got everything. You've got, you know, the eyes on the street. You've got the sidewalk ballet. You've got, uh, I'm not sure how big Bird fits in James Jacobs, but, uh, but um, uh, you know, and the corner shop, Mr. Hooper's corner shop. All of that really, really uh, important here, talking about what the, what the city is. Um, what happens if you take, oh, 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 and I should say to uh, a black kid and a white kid in, in the background enjoying the city together. And at the time that Sesame Street came out, that was absolutely revolutionary. Um, you know, you had Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek, um, and you had Sesame Street, and that was the only interracial television uh, that, 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 that you found at the time. I mean, there were black television programs. There were Sanford and Son and, and things like that, but, but, but they were, there was a kind of a segregation even on television. So here's the beigeified image of that, right? We, we've got multiculturalism, but somehow all the life has been sucked out of the city behind them. Um, here's Jane Jacobs rolling over in her grave. Uh, as, as we see the, 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 um, the beigeness chundering on. So, uh, again, this morning, I think there were some really good examples. There were, that we were looking at community land trusts and ways in which people can self-organize and participatory design practices can be, can be um, uh, brought into place in order to think about how we make places differently. And I think this, uh, it, it, th this really does fall down into a, a particular binary. Bellum omnium contra omnes, which is the war of each against all, the Hobbesian war of each against all, and unus pro omnibus, omnis pro uno, all for one and one for all, uh, which is the, uh, the, the vision of the city that is shared and participatory and with which we uh, interact and, and make our lives. So. Um, Lovely messages throughout history uh, uh, that, that, that you can be a lot of little fishes and still take care of the big fish. Um, 
these kind of allegories are, are evident throughout uh, history. And I wanted to show you, too, the frontispiece of Hobbes' Leviathan. Uh, this is, by the way, the same biblical Leviathan that appears in the mouth of the Luna Park uh, and in the uh, cabaret from hell. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the same Leviathan. Here it's represented as a hierarchical uh, top-down control of the monarch with, uh, 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 with the populace, the body politic, forms the body of the, um, uh, of the monarch, right? right? So mm -hmm. that's what constitutes the rule of law. And underneath it, you have war, of course, supporting that, and God getting into the mix, um, supporting all of that. Um, and there's a really good discussion of this, again, in uh, Kenneth Olwig's work, uh, in his book, Landscape, Nature, and the Body Politic, which features this on its front cover. Um, there's a movement uh, in Spain called Copy Love, uh, which, um, <laughs> this is like the pagan alternative, right? There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a witch's coven uh, taking place on the, on, on the roof of the building over here. There's, there's um, you know, very, very womanly, plentiful figures. Um, and instead of getting the male overpower, in the image, we get a, a, a female kind of idea of the body, body politic with the light streaming from her pedenda on to nourish the city below. I mean, I, th I think this image is just absolutely bonkers. Uh, but uh, but, 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 I, but I, I, I love it because it is a kind of feminized version of the, the Leviathan, and it, it proposes that all for one and one for all kind of, uh, kind of image. And it's bizarre to see all of these kind of faces make, it, yeah, it's just weird, isn't it? Um, but fun. All those faces together create the work that is the city. We often talk about the emptiness of rural life or the, you know, a lot of times people talk about the emptiness and aloneness of, of urban life. But ultimately, it's all the gestures that come together, the works that create the larger work. This is the Lefebvrean oeuvre, uh, which I think is really, really core to Henri Lefebvre's ideas. We often get the, the classic uh, trialectic from Lefebvre, which comes from the production of space. But um, if you've never read Lefebvre before, leave the production of space till last because you really need to really read the uh, Critique of Everyday Life. All three volumes, four if you include rhythm analysis at the end, because you really get his measure. You get the way that he works um, testing ideas. He doesn't start with an argument and end with a conclusion. His ideas just wash over situations, again, what I might call landships, in waves and redistribute them. So, Basically, his works just kind of ask, what if it's like this? What if it's like this? What if it's like this? It's an iterative process, just, mu just much like design. Uh, so if you know that, I think you can dive into Lefebvre and with a different set of expect expectations and really, really enjoy him. Um, the other thing that's really important to Lefebvre is the idea of the moment. Um, and this is the way, a way of thinking about space, time, history, and the legacy of the past that's handed to you by all of this collective work over time. Um, so the moment is a fulfilled moment that can really only be arrived at through educated desire. Uh, so the strawberry is here as a very specific example. So um, the moment kind of functions in this way. You're standing in the strawberry patch on a summer's day and you've got the warm sun on the back of your neck and you pluck a fragrant strawberry from the cool underside of a leaf and you lift that sweet, moist strawberry to your mouth and bite into it and the fragrance and the sweetness reminds you not just of your pleasure in that moment, which is immense and fulfilled, 
but of your debt to everyone that bred strawberries over time to make sure you had that perfect strawberry uh, in your hand. And it also reminds you about your obligation to the future to make sure that the next generation gets an even better strawberry. Uh, so so the, the, the moment um, is actually, I think, a really, really powerful tool for thinking, especially when you pair it up with the idea of the education of desire. Um, and rather than looking around for something new, for the next innovation, uh, I love these words from Catherine Schoenfield, um, uh, where she says, maybe the things that we have, or that we need, are already here, and we just need to start making use of them. Um, the, the, the dream of the future is, is all around us waiting to be mobilized. The vision of prosperity that we can participate in, the tasty city uh, for the future is, is all around us. Thank you. Tim, for the lecture. So uh, we have some minutes for questions or comments. If anyone wants to raise a question or a comment on the Tasty City. <laughs> Perhaps I can start. Uh, you mentioned throughout the review and your presentation the issue of ruralization, no? Uh, re ruralization, no? Like there is this um, kind of uh, focus on cities, no? Mm -hmm. uh, that we see everywhere, no? Obviously, including in schools, no? And there's this uh, resistance, no? To uh, work in the rural or in the landscape uh, or, uh, or the landships that produce cities in the rural, no? So, um, has, has your work, you know, uh, trying to uh, perhaps uh, propagate the necessity to, you know, perhaps decenter the cities and center uh, the rural, no? And I guess, I mean, that's part of the work of the Tasty City, no? Or what you describe, for example, with the strawberry, no? Like uh, there, sh there might be a, a, there's a connection that is lost when separating these two realms, no? There's a uh, there's a you know this focus on you know one part of the equation being interrelated is uh, part of the issue. But how can you help, you know, let's say, to decenter the city and produce perhaps uh, more work or designers interest in that ruralization process, if that's necessary for the tasty city? Um, I, I I don't think it's my aim to decenter the city. Um, uh, uh, I mean, as Judith said earlier, I'm a townie, you know, I love the city and everything that it, it offers. Um, and I, I think it's really important to think about the question of the rural. Um, but as Lefebvre observed, um, uh, uh, um, the wonderful essay of his, which is uh, notes, notes on a summer afternoon uh, in, the, in the countryside. It's a brilliant essay, and it talks about the eruption of the urban into the rural. So I don't think, and it, which it's really the foundation of the landscape urbanism program here, is that you cannot conceive of the countryside and the city without conceiving them as mutually constituted. And I think that's a historical fact, that the city and its hinterlands always have to be considered in tandem or as one uh, if you're going to understand the, the, the way that they, that they operate. Um, may, maybe what I would take issue with is the valorization of the urban uh, as you know, somehow where all the answers are to be found and this, this um, surrender to the inevitability of urbanization. Um, it, 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 I, I think abdicates the idea of, of planning. It steps away from the, from the idea that actually we do have agency in making places and we can design them. Um, you know, whether those processes are participatory design or top-down design, we, are, we can be some, somewhat in, in fact, with climate change, we need to be more in control of our environment in order to, to, to keep it from all falling apart. Um, I use utopianism quite a bit in my work. Utopianism as method, as a tool for thinking, very much in the way that Moylan 
speaks about, that Tom Moylan speaks about the critical utopia, that you have to be able to separate things out, perhaps, and taxonomize them and categorize them so that you can think things through in, in part. But at some point, you've got to encounter the all at onceness of the world so that you can think problems through from, from a, a, a kind of total perspective in a way that's not totalizing design, but that rather is creating worlds. Um, because when we walk out into the streetscape outside, we see a, a legacy of a lot of decisions that are made by very, very narrow thinking. Um, you know, the, this decision was driven by guide dogs for the blind, and this de decision was driven by traffic managers, and this decision, you know, like the need to think things all at once is, is, is really huge. Um, so, so that's, that's something very much I insist upon in, in, in my work, and I think that's right down the middle of the message of landscape urbanism. A a any other questions out there? Wonderful talk, thank you very much. Um, I just wonder where, where we find the antidote to beige. I mean, you, you tentatively endorsed, you know, um, projects like the Hackney Curve Garden, but with, with reservations. But wh where do we look for hope? Where, or how, where do we create um, those opportunities to counter that very sort of totalizing, ubiquitous um, colonization of the city by capital? Um, uh the, the, the way that I frame this in the, in the book is I speak about fragments of utopia, that the city is composed of constellations of fragments of utopia, um, whether that's a, 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 a realization of a utopia of play and pleasure, which might be the Luna Park in Melbourne. Uh, it might be a capitalist uh, utopia, like a particularly beautiful Art Deco department store, or it could be Victor Horta's house, or it could be Le Corbusier's La, uh, La Tourette, you know, it, 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 any, um, Versailles is a, is a, is a regicentric utopia. Um, so if our task is not to do totalizing design, but rather to, f to find the bits of the city that are electrifyingly beautiful and tasty, um, then the task of the designer is to go out and find those fragments of, of utopia and join them up as best you can. Uh, so it's a, it's a practice, um, and I, it's, it's funny, I mentioned, I mentioned Roberta Brandis Gratz uh, a little earlier, her book, The Living City, which was hugely influential back when I was a student, and the practice of incrementalism, actually, of growing the city instead of growing buildings, um, and, and, and connecting all the bits of beauty together that are, that are already there. Oh, Lefebvre has a really uh, productive um, concept that he calls the resid residuum and he says there's however totalizing capitalism becomes in particularly in the city there's what he calls this re residue of human subjectivity sensuality and he uses the word style which is really interesting that that breaks through the 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 kind of neoliberalization of the soul you know the thatcherite thing is never complete N never um and I, uh, I'm very fond, too, of the writing, well, she's a friend of mine, Ewa Majewska, the um, Polish uh, philosopher whose most recent book is Feminist Antifascism. Uh, and she talks about weak resistance um, and the fact that kind of everyday rebellion that's found in domestic acts and private acts, and she uses the early days of solidarity as an example, can bring to its knees something that otherwise seemed inevitable. So communism in Poland, as it was then constituted as this very totalitarian state, was brought to its knees by something that was really very humble. Uh, in fact, in Poland, I mean, you, you wouldn't know it now, unfortunately, with Polish politics, but there was a moment where the meek did inherit the earth. Uh, so, so, so I think I, I, I would side with the meek because the, all those little fishes is where the real power actually is. Um, 
Yeah, over over here. Um, thanks very much for an amazing uh, talk and great slides. And I was really taken with the um, the images of the cars and how they encapsulate what's being sold to people and um, what, how they speak to particular uh, periods. And I'm just wondering, in the future, how, who's going to do the work of making new images, how they're going to be made, where they're going to be presented, and particularly if there's nothing, as one of the last quotations that you showed, particularly if there's nothing to actually be sold. And so this, images are so important, but who's going to produce them without selling something? Um, I, I, I'm not sure we can ever do without selling things. It, it, w uh, David Graeber, the, 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 the anthropologist who worked with anarchist methods, he says, don't ever call me that anarchist anthropologist, because uh, he's using anarchism as a tool, which in fact I do in my writing as well. Um, he said, you know, even if we do away with capitalist markets, we'll still have markets. There still need to be those spaces of desire. I mean, we still need to eat. So fundamentally, an exchange of goods needs to take place in order for us to, to eat because we're not going to find food sovereignty in our, you know, in our spheres of one. Uh, we have to participate in the world, and which posits markets. So how will those markets be constituted? I don't know. Um, but the fact that they will be constituted is something I'm sure of. Does that kind of answer enough? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious about this beigeification as, as like or strategic banalization. Yes. Uh, yes, but I was also curious about if uh, this aesthetic has like a, does it appear in a specific moment or time, or how can we trace it back? Because it, it intuitively it doesn't feel too colonial because it feels like colonialism. I like associate with something that it's a bit too extra. So how, how, how this shift happen, and, and, and is, does this also respond to other political movements to see in a way how shifts can happen currently? Um, I don't know if I could put a finger on when it began, um, but the image making apparatus of the 20th century is what you know, what, what, what Benjamin wrote about in the reproduction of art, um, the, 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 the reflection of life in a proliferation of images is precisely what's behind the creation of the, of the beige hole. Um, that it, it's, it's a product of real estate imagery that needs to be exchangeable. Um, right, it's, it's not a use economy, it's a market economy. Um, so things need to be the same so that they could be compared in, the, in, you know, in just the way that you parcel out the land in order to make it the same, whether the topography's doing this or that. Um, it, it, it is precisely that kind of process. And the, the colonialism that's inherent in capitalism is of the dominant classes extracting the collectively created goods of the commons. Extracting the collectively created goods of the commons. Right, so if the city is a work of the commons and a collective work over time, it's the enclosure by capital of that commons and the conversion into an exchangeable commodity. Uh, so, so that, I think, is precisely what's behind the beigeification of the, of, of the city, of the, that strategic banalization, just so that things can be compared. We're about to be encroached upon, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, team. Yeah.